Okay. Yeah, it's gonna get uh, uh, it's gonna get uh, get cold. I think. Okay. Hopefully, Exarc is live now. I'm just double checking that I can okay. view the live on the YouTube channel. Live. There we go. Marcus Clerk's expedition. Let's have a look. Oh, there we are. Okay. Great. So it is working. I will make wow. this a little bigger so that I can see any questions that might come in. Uh, good. Oops. Let's make this a little smaller. Apologies, everyone. All the <laughs> if anyone's joined, don't know if anyone's joined. No, we don't even know. <laughs> you know if it's the two of us chatting away, you know. <laughs> How do we know if we have anybody <laughs> on, you know? Well, the nice thing is with this, because we're doing it through YouTube, it will then automatically get saved as a video as well. So yeah. we'll have the uh, that there, which will be good. Um, okay, well, I guess uh, we'll, we'll sort of get started. Um, oh, yes, thank you, uh, Roland. Indeed, uh, for any of you who are already watching, um, there's technically a minute, but really, if you're nice and prepared, then you should already be present at the meeting before it, it starts. So maybe there's some people here, but I'll keep blabbering a little bit just in case some people are joining at exactly 12. Um, we are here uh, today. Oh, there we go. 12 o'clock on the dot. We are here today with uh, with Marcus Click, uh, who is joining me this side, this side, um, to uh, talk about his uh, upcoming expedition, which we'll get into uh, in a little bit. But uh, just a few technical things. If you have any questions for Marcus throughout the chat, do feel free to pop them into the little chat box um, to the right of the screen. Uh, and I will be keeping an eye on that. So hopefully then I will see them and be able to ask any questions. Uh, and you will also be able to get some updates uh, as well after this chat. But um, for now, hello, Marcus. <laughs> welcome. Hey. For, welcome. Thank you for joining me um, today. So first of all, for those who have absolutely no idea what we are talking about, could you perhaps just give a little brief summary of the project itself. What will you be doing? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, thank you uh, that you guys are having me here on the Exarc uh, YouTube channel. That's uh, really, I really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, so about the project, I call it the Nordic Walkabout 2024. And this will be a, a Stone Age uh, gear trip in, um, in Southern Lapland, so in, in Sweden at the end of uh, February. So I will be traveling there for now. Uh, it's just me by myself with um, a gear like it could have been in the Stone Age for uh, two weeks, which is uh, over there. It's midwinter. It's kind of an alpine situation, subarctic alpine situation. So um, that is the plan. And the, 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 the idea behind it is to test the uh, equipment and see how uh, traveling was possible during the Stone Age. Um, yes, that's the that's the idea. <laughs> and, and is the equipment what I see hanging behind you uh, at the moment? Yes, there's a few. Uh, there's a few things in the in the back there that will be um, coming along. The, the the sled, the snowshoes, then my coat, and uh, a few other things. Yeah. Yeah. And so I believe that this project is a secondary project following on from one that you previously did, as you mentioned. So what first actually inspired you to do that first initial project? It seems like quite a big undertaking to just decide one day, oh, why not go for a, yeah. for a trek? It's, yes, the, the first um, project was uh, last year. Uh, in, but that was basically in my, in my home, on my home turf, the Black Forest here in, uh, uh, in Germany. And um, so, but, but what inspired me is that... Um, well, it's it's. I work as uh, in the in the field of traditional uh, technology and high tanning. That's my that's my profession, and I do a lot of work on, at museums, and I do lectures and all that sort of uh, things. So I have all these uh, objects that I uh, show to people that I make all the clothing, all the equipment, and everything. And of course, I also test these things. You know, I go out on day hikes and I test them in my backyard here and there. But of course, it's a totally different uh, situation if you um, take this gear and you uh, do a, a longer trip where you really have to rely on your equipment. You can get a lot of uh, different information, more, um, more exact different uh, information than from just testing it in, on, on, on little day hikes. So that was um, the idea. The idea is very old, you know, it, but it took me uh, a few years to finally decide, okay, let's do a, a winter trip like this in uh, uh, 
in the Black Forest, first of all. Oops, sorry, I've muted myself. Um, and indeed, uh, it's like you say, it's really interesting. These experimental archaeology projects, so often when people do experimental archaeology, they do it on a much smaller scale. And there's very few that are actually such big actually testing the material <laughs> um which yeah it's yeah. not a, it's it's not an experiment in in that case like you no. would usually know from experimental archaeology exactly where you do it do it in a scientific setting you know anybody can repeat it uh that sort of thing uh, it, it's a different type of uh experiment it's a yeah it's it's um in, in that way you, you cannot of course it, um yeah it's not the same. You cannot you cannot compare it, and of course you cannot also get the same um, information out of it than in a in a regular experimental archaeology project. Mm. Um, yes, that's a it's a different thing. Yeah. So it's more to get the experience to see how these things function in reality, so to speak. Uh, yes, of course, it's more subjective. Mm. Yeah. In, a, in a way, uh, more subjective. Uh, but you cannot, of course, get the information that I'm getting from my gear. In, in any other uh, situation, I don't think it's possible. Yeah. It's, it's something that you have to do. You have to wear the clothing uh, for an extended uh, period of time and it has to be in a real life situation. So um, you have to sleep in it. You know, you have to, to see if there's enough movement. You have to see if the seams hold up. All this sort of thing is nothing you can do in an afternoon in the in the backyard of a museum. You know? yeah, yeah. So it has to be a real life situation for a real life uh, experiment. So you get a real life information out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And so the aim, though, is to to check the material. But is that in order to um, compare that against, for example, archaeological examples that we see from the past to see how these objects would have worked is it to compare with i don't know ethnographic accounts or his kind of yes. what can these projects actually tell us about the past i guess yeah of course uh, archaeologically it's uh, as we all know there's basically uh, just bones and stones and, <laughs> and antler <laughs> you know i mean or let's let's put it that way a lot of the of the material culture is basically gone. We don't have a we don't have a lot of finds. You know, mm -hmm. the, the majority is gone. It's all the soft materials, especially the the clothing, the textiles. The further you go back, the less you have. Yeah. So if you go back to the the periods that I like to portray, uh, let's say the end of the Ice Age, uh, then we don't really have a, a whole lot. You know, and it's mm -hmm. difficult to. Uh, uh, recreate whatever equipment they had because there's so little finds yeah. so you have to go into uh, ethnology and see okay people that live under similar conditions or um, how did they equip themselves and you have to take whatever uh, archaeological information you have and incorporate it so it's it's kind of a mix of archaeological information and uh, information taken from uh, from indigenous uh, cultures from the subarctic mm -hmm. So of course, then, but for me, it's uh, it's important um, as I work a lot with the uh, with with the public um, regarding the Stone Age equipment that I can uh, really um, it, it gives me a lot more a uh, lot more depth and real information if I talk to them about the things that I present than when I just make them and present them that way. So I have mm. it's there's more it's it's more realistic. It's mm. I can talk more about these things. And for me, it's then uh, have a, mo a better feeling, um, a more lively uh, feeling telling people how it might have been, as we all don't know how, how it was. But this is a, a intelligent guesswork, I call it. I take as much information as I can get and then uh, present it to the public as that's the uh, state uh, as the state of the art is at, at this point archaeologically. Yeah. No, really interesting. And did you find that there were, for example, things that you experienced for your, from your previous expedition that you conducted uh, last year in Germany? Um, were there, yeah, any any lessons you learned, shall we say, any changes that you're making this time round based on your past experience? Well, first, I would say it's. It, I learned that my equipment uh, works. You know that it it basically works, which is already a big woohoo uh, because it's all made from scratch basically and. Uh, uh, and that that you can I can feel at home with the equipment th that I have, and it's not you don't feel estranged or weird. I really had the feeling, okay, this is my situation, this is what I have, and I'm out there, and it and it works. And of course, there were a few things that didn't work that well, 
and I need to, of course, adjust also because uh, Scandinavia in midwinter is a different situation than uh, uh, midwinter in, in Germany. And I think the main thing that uh, I had to change were the boots. I had some issues with my with my boots. You know, I posted this earlier. They kind of I boiled the the the, uh, the soles of my boots. I got them too close to the fire, uh, drying. It's kind of a classic thing to do. It happened to me before, and it happened again. So I have to make new boots, and also a different sleeping bag. I have to adjust the the equipment. I really have to make new things. I have to adjust the equipment. I have to make a new sled. The sled didn't work very well. Uh, I need to get a, a better sleeping bag um, out of from reindeer skins. So there's a few things I had to change in the equipment. I have to get snow goggles. You know, I made, <laughs> made snow goggles with lenses, you know, because yeah. I <laughs> lenses, and I didn't have an antler piece big enough to fit over my, uh, over my uh, glasses. So I incorporated some lenses in here. So I had to make this. And uh, yeah, pants. I have to make new pants. Really, I have them here, big, nice, bulky pants with winter fur in there. So wow. yeah, amazing. <laughs> because there might be, it might be really severe temperatures there. And did you? I mean, last time as well, and this time, do you also take um, for uh, uh, what's the word? Time appropriate, I guess, uh, mending equipment and and tools and things, or do you, for example, take some modern needles just in case you need to do a quick sew job? Uh, no, I take I uh, I have um, uh, primitive equipment. Okay, okay, okay. And last time I did not need it. Also, there's a few things that I would uh, that I'm not taking this time that I took uh, last time. Like for example, a water bottle. It's totally useless if you have mm -hmm. minus fifteen or twenty degrees. Water freezes, and you're just carrying around a block of ice. <laughs> you know, that's, that's of no use. And uh, so I I. Hopefully, I will be able to repair most of my equipment. The sled might be a little difficult because it's made out of uh, pieces of, of, of wood, really thin, mm -hmm. the so-called toboggan. It's known from the subarctic in uh, North America. So if something breaks there, we'll see how I fix it. But I will have flint tools, the, the basic flint tool uh, equipment, and also thong, of course, you know, like strings, pieces to, to mend things. Uh, basic repair equipment so i should be able to uh to fix uh things along the way if they break yeah and i imagine because the, the kind of tests that you're doing would have been for potentially cultures who would have been living in these conditions for a longer period of time but i suppose they were also seasonally changing so do you think that for example if you would have had a, a sled or a toboggan that you would have used last year you could reuse it in future years just to thinking about the cultures um of the past or do you think these are things that are remade each season no i think the, the clothing we know if we go to the uh, ethnographic um records about the inuit and other cultures they would have to remake the complete equipment every year oh. um, <laughs> If, if they had enough heights, if they had the, the capacity, uh, but potentially it's it's a remaking uh, every, every year and reuse the, the old clothing for, for the summer. Mm -hmm. But because the hair wear off, uh, you need to, uh, to remake these clothes. I think the sled, of course, would last a lot longer. Snowshoes mm -hmm. also. But I also will take a copy of snowshoes. The, 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 the so-called oldest snow, snowshoes of the world have been found in the, in the Alps in Switzerland, but they mm -hmm. date to the Neolithic. Okay. But those, uh, to me, they appear to be made um, in a in a survival or in a situation where they needed snowshoes. They didn't carry them. They're made from uh, from from bent sticks, very simple, mm -hmm. but also very uh, technically very uh, refined. But this is something you make when you need it, and when you don't need it, you discard them. So I will take those along and mm -hmm. see how long they last. You know, how long do these snowshoes last? And also inner shoes for my boots made from uh, untanned rabbit skins. So you skin oh, the rabbit in, in a tube and you just slip your foot inside. Because oh, wow. the skin is so thin, uh, you don't need tanning. It's, it's flexible enough. Mm -hmm. That's also what people would do in the subarctic in, in North America. And when they wear out, the fur is gone, then they're gone. Mm -hmm. So this is two things uh, that are made ad hoc, basically. And uh, I will see how long they last and record that, of course, get an idea and get a feeling how, how this works. Oh. And uh, yeah. yeah. Amazing. <laughs> and uh, it sounds like a proper adventure. Um, I mean, yeah. do you foresee any um, 
kind of issues? Have you prepared for anything particular? Because as you said, this is going to be a lot more, I guess, mm-hmm. extreme. Uh, yeah. It sounds like some survival show or something, but you know what I mean, um, compared to your last expedition. Yes. Are there any particular, apart from just making things a bit warmer, <laughs> any particular <laughs> extra uh, ad- additions or changes you've had to make? Yeah, definitely the temperatures. Uh, uh, it's very obvious. The temperatures will be uh, most likely very different. And uh, we saw the last few months, you know, they had really low temperature. They had kind of temperature records from minus 30 to minus 40. And this is really extreme. And it, it kind of scares me also you know, because I'm not familiar with temperatures uh, like that. So I have mm-hmm. to make uh, adjustments in the in the clothing, of course. And then it's also um, I'm not familiar with the terrain. You know, when I did the trip in, uh, in the Black Forest, I would just walk out behind my uh, house and I know the terrain, I'm really familiar. It's really like in a stone age setting, I, I felt where you don't need orientation because you know the area. You go mm-hmm. to the next hill and you know you have this and you can orient yourself there and then find your way. But mm-hmm. this will be different. This will be new land to me. I don't uh, I don't know it. I mean, I've been to Scandinavia many times and also to the Fjell, but not in the winter and not at the area. So I will need to ha- take maps and... Um, that's the thing is the orientation, the temperatures, and then also just to see if it's uh, for me, if it's physically possible to be hiking for uh, two weeks constantly in the in the snow with a sled with more gear to uh, to carry um, that also. And uh, yeah, those are the, the main the three main points, I would say. Mm. Which relates to we've had a couple of questions coming in. And so the latest one I've just seen pop up. Um, is indeed about sort of navigating. Will you be going from A to B? Will you be doing a round trip? Do you have kind of a a test situation <laughs> that you're going to be doing, or is it just a, a long slog? <laughs> it's it's a long slog. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about. I don't like the round trip thing. To me, it doesn't in my head. It I don't like it. You know, I'd rather go from A to B. So I decided. Uh, to start A, w- which is easy to start, is easy. But if I will reach B. <laughs> I don't know. I have B uh, set up, um, but there's options to uh, to uh, get out of the situation in between. Mm-hmm. So it's basically it's in uh, southern Lapland. It's uh, called uh, Jemtland, the area, and it will be in the Fjell. That means in the in, in the in the mountains close to the uh, to the Norwegian border, and it will be along the the, the southern Kungsleden. Kungsleden is like a big hiking trail. It's kind of famous in in uh, in Sweden. So this is sort of the uh, the area where where this will be happening. So do you are you expecting to meet other hikers and things on your on your travels, or are you going to be going kind of off road? Um, that I that I don't know yet. Mm-hmm. I'm not really keen on walking on these uh, 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 snowmobile trails, which mm-hmm. they also have there. You know, I might use them every once in a while. And I will probably meet people. I'm I'm prepared. I met a lot of people in the Black Forest, of course. It was always fun, you know, <laughs> to talk to them. It, it, it has been in television before, so a lot of people were prepared. They said, "Oh my God, are you the one?" So we had these talks, and I have little little flyers, you know, to hand out to uh, to the Swedish people <laughs> if I meet them or or, the, or other Germans because it's kind of. Uh, it's it, it's a sport to go up to uh, to Norway in the winter or to Sweden. A lot of people actually do that. So I might be on occasion be meeting people. But the end of February is not really the season yet to do these kind of expeditions. Usually people go later when the temperatures are uh, when it's warmer and you still have snow and you have more light also. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 because no, the days in February, end of February into March are still fairly, fairly short. Still quite short. And yeah, on that note, so in terms of practicalities, I'm just curious. So, for example, what what do you eat? How do you light? I mean, of course, you can make fires and things. But in, if does that mean you'll only be traveling during daylight hours or uh, how will that work? Well, I will be traveling during daylight hours, most likely. But supposedly the narcs, the, 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 the nights are fairly light because of the uh, because of all the snow around but i don't plan to be traveling at night uh, unless i um uh i have to and uh what was the other what was it uh, was... food food ah, food <laughs> yes <laughs> yes because i'm I, I will not go hunting you know i don't have a hunting that's what license. i was curious about yes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a hunting license uh, yeah. otherwise i could probably do that um 
And there's, of, of course, in the winter, not a whole lot uh, uh, to gather. You know, I might gather something, some, I don't know, chew some bark or whatever, you know. But mostly, I will, uh, most of the food I will take along in the form of, of, of dehydrated. Of course, it all has to be dehydrated so it doesn't freeze. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot less weight and takes up a lot less room if the if the things are dried or um, some are salted. So I have dried meat, a lot of dried meats, a lot of fat also, uh, pemmican and um, uh, lots of dried fruits, some nuts also. So I'm trying to keep it. Uh, of course, it has. I keep it Stone Age. I don't have to take power bars and all mm. instant soups and all that <laughs> sort of stuff. You know, <laughs> but it's not. It's not fixed to one period. You know, I will mm. have hazelnuts. So there's no hazelnuts at the end of the Ice Age. So I, 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 except the very, the very end, maybe I don't know. Yeah. 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 So some fish. Also, I will take some dried fish and um, oh, maybe, maybe slap on a frozen. Uh, pork chop or yeah. pork chops or whatever i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay, well, be plenty of food. i mean the nice thing is indeed you'll be in a natural freezer so yeah you don't yes, have to worry about the food yes off. you can take whatever you want it's not gonna spoil you know <laughs> yes yeah exactly Sorry, I'm just getting a, a child given to me, but she's sitting here yes. for now, so she should be okay. Um, but I may have to grab her at some point. <laughs> but uh, but perfect. Um, we have a couple of other questions. Yes. Um, ah, this one. Why Sweden? Why not, for example, Canada? <laughs> yeah, Canada. I mean, <laughs> I was about to say. It's already a lot of planning for me uh, to go to Sweden. You know, it's 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 also we're coming to the costs. You know, of this whole thing. Yes, mm -hmm. we may not forget. But um, Sweden, um, because I also I have like a special connection uh, to Sweden. Um, we went there with my parents when I was a kid. We went to Sweden a lot. Yeah. My first girlfriend, my first big love was from Sweden. And I spent a lot of time in Sweden Ooh. also. And I really like it. And it's really close for me. Uh, uh, not that close, but uh, closer than, of course, Canada. Mm -hmm. And I usually don't like to go to exotic places where I'm not at home. You know, I did mm -hmm. something that and I don't it doesn't feel right for me to fly miles and miles and miles to a different, completely different situation. So that's why I did the first trip in my backyard, because to me, it's more realistic to be traveling in an area that I'm familiar with. Of course, we're, I'm not that familiar with Sweden, but I've been there. I kind of have a feeling, okay, I know what it's like. And uh, it's also, it's not that far away. The, yeah. it, it's much easier uh, with the log logistics uh, to go there and and do it in Sweden than uh, in Canada, but I'm open to who's we'll see what happens mm -hmm. next year or the year after. But I like to keep it close. Uh, yeah, gosh, yeah. Go, going on the pre the pattern so far, next year it'll have to be another yeah, level. Yeah, it'll get more next, and more extreme. Next, yes, next year I have to go across <laughs> uh, Greenland or something yeah, stupid. Exactly. You know? oh, uh, Philly, of course, no. I, I take it slow, you know. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. Um, and we have uh, one more question, which I quite like. There is a phrase, please don't try this at home. What are the activities should you not do at home that you are most looking forward to? Okay, which you should not do at home. Yeah, I mean, I guess most of the things. <laughs> because... yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like the whole trip, don't, don't do it. <laughs> if you're not ready for it. So, um... Yeah, I think that's, of course, for me, it, it's it's a big experiment. There, there will be uh, things that I have not uh, encountered before, you know. So, um, but that's also why I decided I want to go to the to the uh, middle of Sweden. I'm not going to uh, to the Zareg National Park, where there is where it's much more extreme. I'm not going to the Arctic. I'm going uh, there now. It's it's extreme enough for me, and uh, so I will slowly but surely try to to upgrade my my skills and my uh, equipment um but in that sense also don't try it at home it's like if there's anybody out there who feels uh, inclined to to join you know to join me it doesn't have to be like a solo uh, uh i can do this sort of trip um contact me and we 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 can see if you want to join in for a week or at the end or at the beginning or just a few days or whatever and i'm also very much open to to advice by people that have done these sort of uh, trips uh, that have done winter traveling be it wherever i know there's a lot of people that have a lot more experience than i do so i'm very much open to advice and and exchange of of information yeah perfect and if anyone does want to get in touch with marcus and doesn't 
follow him himself. You can find him through the Exarch page as well. Uh, we've been sharing his stuff, so you'll see it there, which relates as well to this next question that's just popped up, which is what methods will you use to document the project? Yeah, of course, I will have to take uh, some technological equipment, you know, which uh, yeah you can't do without because if <laughs> if you don't film it and you don't take photos, it didn't exist. You know? That's <laughs> How it is these things, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I will have a photographer come along, but not for the whole trip, but for at least for a, a few days. He has worked with me together with me on the on the last trip, and uh, you have probably seen some of his photos. He makes really nice photos. Yeah, so we will have yeah. the photographer there at the beginning or at the end. I don't know um, yet when. And I will also, of course, have my uh, my my camera with me my mobile phone and uh, so i will mostly document it with the with the mobile phone because i don't want to take extensive gear and equipment mm. um but of course i will see have to see if i need electricity for that thing you know might have to like take solar panels and all this sort of stuff mm. but it will be mostly be documented through uh, over the the the, uh, the the mobile phone unless the photographer in the end says well you know i have this little take this gopro cam or whatever um, mm -hmm. but so far i only know about uh, do my my uh, mobile phone and of course, I will write things down. I already start writing things down. I'm sort of keeping a, a kind of a journal in the preparation situation uh, now, and I will also write things down along the uh, along the way. And also, I can pop in here as well and say that we are going yes. to hopefully be uh, sharing some of these videos and photos and yes. and insights from Marcus through the uh, Exarch channel during his expedition. Yes. Hopefully we have to see if it works um, with with internet and electricity and everything. But uh, so, yes, do make sure to keep an eye out for the Nordic walkabout uh, hashtag on our channel so that we can follow that. And we will also be doing another live chat uh, afterwards um, with Marcus to hear all about his experiences, hear all about what went fantastic, what went wrong um, and uh, all of uh, all of that kind of thing. Maybe uh, one final thing before before we wrap up, um, because you seem to have so much wonderful equipment there with you, perhaps you could. Uh, show us, I don't know, your favorite pieces uh, or something. And indeed, uh, another question that's just come through is how many hours of work did you spend preparing all of this gear? Countless hours. It's, it's, <laughs> impossible, it's impossible to count this. You know, I uh, sometimes I do count hours and, and work time just to be able to to uh, transfer it to the public on my, on my uh, museum shows. I can tell people, okay, this and this takes that and that long. And I, of course, will also weigh things, you know, I will see how much uh, the things weigh, how the, the seams, I will count the, 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 the stitching and that sort of stuff. But um, in terms of time, it's uh, you can't tell because it's my profession, you know, I do this mm -hmm. during the day, this is my work. And uh, so at some point the things are done, but I tell you, it takes a lot of work. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot of work. And my favorite pieces at the moment are the, the sled, you know, the, the toboggan is made, made mostly with uh, Stone Age uh, tools, some Neolithic tools. Also, I use some uh, uh, polished um, stone axes on that. So that's one of my favorite uh, pieces of equipment. And I need to test it a little more, you know, here in the in the Black Forest, in the mountains, before mm -hmm. I uh, go, if I see to have to make any adjustments. And also my new boots. These are oh, my wow. new boots, you know, <laughs> but the, the, the winter fur are really big. It's <laughs> wow. they be warm. There will be inner boots uh, of felt in there. And like I said, these, these bunny skins uh, first. And then when, once the bunny skins were out, I will use the, the inner uh, boots made from, made from felt. And of course, the pants that I showed. <laughs> um, yes, because those are uh, the, the things that I just made. The coat is in the back. That's the classic. I've had this for... Uh, a few years and it, uh, oh. it works very very well yeah still holding up after still holding use. up yeah. yeah okay nice the, the toboggan just it looks so thin is it quite thin is the it toboggan? heavy the, the toboggan sorry ah, the tobog toboggan is very thin yeah yeah it's from two pieces of uh something fell down two pieces <laughs> of uh birch wood so they're yeah. just about five millimeters thick wow and uh, the sled is it's it's very narrow, you know. It's, a, it's you see, it's a very narrow sled, but it's long, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> end, you know, and uh, 
but then it has less uh less friction in the snow in the front if it's not that wide yeah and uh it just weighs about two kilos you know so wow. it's fairly it's fairly light so yeah. i will have a backpack to carry gear and i will have uh things on the on the toboggan also okay. yeah. amazing well, I think uh, we're getting close to the half hour mark, so I think maybe we will uh, wrap things up. But uh, thank you so much for coming and uh, chatting. Was there any sort of final, I don't know, comments or ideas or pieces of wisdom or I don't know, anything that you uh, wanted to share with people who are watching? Yeah, maybe can... I, I, I may be so free to uh, to um, talk about my crowdfunding also. Please do, yes. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> because last year for me it was... Also, of course, a lot of preparation, but I could start in my backyard, basically, uh, to make the trip. And this time, of course, there's a lot more uh, um, preparation and also the the uh, the, um, the finances I need to, to uh, spend a lot more money for the preparation and also for the traveling. It's a longer trip and all this sort of stuff. And uh, as I don't have anybody in the background that is funding this whole thing, but I'm doing uh, this uh, of my own pocket, so to say, uh, I've started a crowdfunding um, campaign that is running now for 30 days. And I hope that anybody, you, you can give any amount of money which you like from one dollar or one euro to, uh, to as much as you want. <laughs> There's also little gifts you're getting. You know, you can have a look at the at the website, the Start Next website, where the crowdfunding uh, is on. I will post this, or I already have posted it in my in my social media. And uh, yeah, I would really appreciate the support so I can do these kinds of uh, events and also then share it with the public, you know, talk to people about it, to, to the people that uh, follow me, but also the general public, which is very interested. I know people always love it at the museums when they see the, the 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 things that I make and talk to them about the Stone Age. And I can do this a lot better with this experience uh, of these sort of trips in the background than when I just talk uh, basically from the couch. Uh. Yeah. So um, yes, please support me uh, yes. <laughs> financially. That would be great. <laughs> I would really appreciate that. Yeah, and I think uh, maybe one of our Exarch elves in the background might be able to paste that link into the chat because I was hoping I could find it, but I can't find it right now um, while I'm looking. I know you emailed it to me yesterday, but I'm afraid. Uh, but uh, yes, and we also just have one final comment then um, saying, good luck, Marcus. Hope you succeed. If not, maybe give archaeologists something to scratch their heads about in 5,000 years time. Exactly. So that's right. <laughs> and you said we will have a talk afterwards. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, on that note, very good luck, uh, Marcus. If anyone Thank wants you. to follow uh, Marcus's journey, you can uh, follow us through Exarch, also Marcus's social media. Um, and uh, indeed, check out the crowdfunding campaign. It will be running uh, until he goes off so that you can help yes. him and become a part of this really amazing adventure. Uh, so yes, watch this space. Good luck. And, yes, thank uh, you, Matilda. Great. Hopefully talk to you soon. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Are we off?